Thank you, Gemma. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm going to be fairly short because our previous speakers have said a lot about the history of the conflict and um, I don't really want to repeat any of that, but I do want to say something about the geopolitics of the conflict and the region, the Middle East region, and the implications there. Uh, I've got some slides here. I'm going to skip over some of them where there's, where there's been some repetition. So this is, this is a little overview of some things which have been touched on by the others. Um, there is information in the Western media about what has been happening in Syria from the very beginning, but you have to dig around to find it, basically. It's not very obvious. Um, uh, the interesting thing is that the failures of the media, which have been spoken of by Jasmine and, and Jay in particular, the failures of the media are in face of the fact that those people that should have been doing that sort of investigation didn't. For example, the, the genocidal slogan that Jasmine mentioned uh, that was being chanted in Homs, um, uh, Christians to Beirut, Alois to the tomb, um, was reported in the Western media in May 2011, right at the beginning. So the people who were lauded as the, the secular, um, the secular um, revolutionaries or the moderate rebels, whatever they call them these days, the Farouk Brigade, which is the biggest group of the Free Syrian Army at that time, were the people that were terrorising Homs with that slogan. And it was reported in the Western media. It wasn't a secret, basically. But after that, for many, many, many uh, years after that, uh, that was ignored. Here's a, a, a Jesuit priest who was eventually murdered in 2014 by those same groups in Homs who pointed out, contrary to what the White House had said, contrary to what Human Rights Watch had said, they'd said there were peaceful protesters for almost the entire first year, basically, and eventually the peaceful protesters were forced to take up arms. He said, no, they were, they were armed from the beginning. I got interested in this conflict looking at what was happening in Dara in March 2011 because... Having seen violence in other countries, I knew it didn't come from, from nowhere. Violence comes from somewhere. Where did it come from? What was the origins of it? And so I started studying Dara, what, what, how the violence had broken out in Dara at that time. And a chapter in the book that I'll show you the, the web link to it in a moment is, is all about that. And that was reported in the media too. It was reported in the Israeli media, the Lebanese media, the British media, that snipers were killing police and health workers in Dara. And then later on, there was a type of a cover-up where neither the opposition nor the government were admitting that soldiers were being killed in, around Dara in, in April 2011. But um, I documented that in the book. A little bit on the double game before I come to the geopolitics. You know, uh, if you looked at some of the Western think tanks were talking about, um, well, you know, they were... Uh, the, the Syrian rebels were... Um, when they realised they weren't really secular revolutionaries, they were called moderate is Islamists and all sorts of different names. But the US intelligence reports we now, from, know, now know from that time were saying to the US government, this is in 2012, that the Salafists, the Muslim Brotherhood and Al-Qaeda in Iraq, which was ISI, Islamic State in Iraq, before ISIS went across the border and created ISIS, are the major forces driving the insurgency in Syria. Al-Qaeda and Iraq supported the Syrian opposition from the beginning, they said, in 2012 to the, to the US government. And then they went on to say, there is the possibility of establishing a Salafist principality, that is to say an Islamic state, in the eastern Syria, which is where ISIS came to the following year. Um, and that is, US intelligence said, exactly what the supporting powers, and that the US, the Saudis, Turkey, the UK and France, uh, to the opposition want, in order to isolate the Syrian regime. So the fact that three years later on they'd be saying they're supporting moderate rebels when their intelligence was saying and interpreting what exactly what they wanted was a sectarian state in eastern Syria linked up to a sectarian state in Iraq, um, that behind the scenes, that was what was going on. So there's this, there was this double game going on from the beginning. You may recall there was the idea of humanitarian intervention because all the army or the president had ever done was kill Syrian civilians apparently. That shifted to the protective intervention um, later on around the phenomenon of ISIS. A year and a half ago, a series of senior US officials, Vice President Joe Biden, the head of the US military, General Martin Dempsey, 
and the head of the Senate Armed Forces Committee, um, what was his name, Lindsey Graham, um, admitted that their allies were funding ISIS and every other extremist group that was committed to overthrowing the Syrian state. They admitted that 18 months ago. What have we heard for the last 18 months? The media will go back to talking about moderate rebels and you know the rep moderate rebels supposedly fighting ISIS and all the rest of the stuff. It's been admitted by the most senior US officials and the narrative doesn't change. It's an extraordinary indictment really of the Western liberal media and I say liberal media because the conservative media normally you would expect to support the government but the liberal media has this idea that they're some sort of watchdog on what's going on and they're going to look into and investigate and criticise. Now, the liberal media, the UK Guardian, for example, the New York Times, have been the worst of all of them, really. And even though the information has been there and it's been admitted by US officials that their allies are, are supporting all of the extremist groups, they haven't used that information. There's just a little bit more to back up what was said before, that the, 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 the US, former US ambassador to Syria on the left, uh, Robert Ford, who trained with the, the, the heads of the death squads in Iraq and Central America before it, and the Free Syrian, one of the Free Syrian Army commanders at that time, that same commander was fighting to get control of Banag Air Base in Aleppo back in 2013, only recently being uh, liberated by the Syrian Army. Some of the moderate rebel leaders there talking about genocide of minorities in Syria just last year. So the position hasn't changed. The genocidal slogans from 2011, the public meanderings of these people on, on their own Facebook sites, what was this one, Lamia Nahas was saying, what a good bloke Adolf Hitler was and the Ottomans in exterminating the Armenians and, and whatever. Uh, they still talk that way publicly. It's not a secret. Um, it's been gone over the, the, the regional states that support the extremist groups, Saudi Arabia, Turkey, Qatar, Israel, covert, more covertly, generally speaking, because most people hate Israel in the region, so they've kept a low profile there. There's the main militia fighting with the Syrian army in Syria at the moment. And one thing that this conflict's done in five years is really forge a very strong Syrian army, even though this, it, it's estimated the Syrian army has lost between 60,000 and 80,000 soldiers in five years. Um, something like that. That's why most families are affected by this war. Everyone's lost someone in this war. Um, that, uh, despite that, the army is a very much more capable outfit than it probably was five years ago. The same thing happened with Iran when Saddam Hussein was sold onto Iran in the 80s and the Iranian army, when, when the new Islamic Republic was there in 1979, was very weak. Um, that's why the US pushed Saddam to attack them back there. After 10 years of war, They'd suffered terrible losses, but the Iranian army was the strongest in the region. Now the combination of the Syrian army with Iranian support, with Hezbollah support, with the militia from Iraq, which is highly significant, is undoubtedly the strongest military in the entire region, stronger than the Egyptian army, because of the practice, because of the alliance that's been forged there. And here's the other regional militia in Syria, the main ones really, the 12 at the bottom there, which are from the regions, some of them from uh, from communities, some Shia, some Druze, um, some from the coast, um, two Palestinian militia. Um, you have to admit that the Palestinians were split over this because the Palestinian Islamists, some of them supported Jabhat al-Nusra. Um, the Hamas militia in Yamuk camp was destroyed um, in April last year when Jabhat al-Nusra, who they invited, invited in Islamic State, the Islamic State went in uh, killed about a third of the Hamas militia, another third joined IS and another third went to the Syrian army and sought refuge there. So they're the militia on the right hand side, the Kurdish militia in northern, in northern Syria um, and the, the Syrian Democratic Front which is three quarters Kurdish militia with some of the Arab uh, tribal communities joining in, in, that, in that part of eastern Syria there. They've been in alliance with the Syrian government too although you have to acknowledge that there is now a split between Damascus and the YPG because the Kurds have announced that they want a federation. Damascus says they don't want a federation. Most likely they'll get some form of autonomy short of a federation. Um, the 4 plus 1 has been spoken of as this new alliance, which I would call the enhanced axis of resistance. The axis of resistance traditionally was the relationship between Iran, Syria and Hezbollah. 
Hezbollah, which is not a state, but the most powerful non-state militia in the region. Um, they have been the main suppliers of weapons to the Palestinian resistance, and that's why Israel hates them, and that's why Israel hates Iran. Now what's happened as a result of this conflict is the relationships with the relationship between Baghdad and Iran um, improved steadily after the overthrow of Saddam Hussein. That is precisely why the US decided to create the Islamic State by using the Saudis in Iraq back in 2006. Um, and we know that Al-Qaeda in Iraq, which was also called the Islamic State in Iraq, initially was Iraqi and then, um, according to US military sources, um, by 2006, when they seized a lot of documents at Sinjar on the border, they found that 40% of them were Saudi Arabians, about a quarter of them were from North Africa and then from all sorts of other countries. So that is ISI, Al-Qaeda in Iraq at first, before it became ISIS in, in, um, in, across the border into Syria. I call it the 4 plus 2 because there has been consistently in the last five years um, Palestinian militia fighting alongside the Syrian army within Syria. So that's the forces as they line up now, and that's what's created that. And with the, particularly with the intervention of Russia, Russian air power on the September the 30th last year, five and a half months ago, that's what's been this very powerful um, alliance that has turned the military tide in Syria. Um, the <coughs> The effects of that, a brief sort of provisional accounting of that the Russians have put up along these sorts of lines in five and a half months. By the way, when the Russian air power went in there, the Russians were always providing some logistic support to the Syrians, but when the air power went in there and they started bombing the, the terrorist groups, um, uh, President Putin said it was going to last till about March. So it wasn't unexpected totally, or it caught us pretty much by surprise, but if you go back to when they went in, they were talking about a limited objective there. Of course, to distinguish themselves from what the Soviet Union had done in Afghanistan, of course, and there are a number of important differences you can, you can notice there. The most important one being there was this very strong ground force that had been forged together, and the ground force was necessary to make the gains on the ground. Well, the gains, the Russians say that they'd hit in 9,000 flights, 26,000 terrorist objects, including all of those things there, and including um, a bit more than Jay said, uh, almost 3,000 oil tankers, they, they say. They've helped the Syrian army liberate 400 towns, and some pictures on the right there of families going back into Hama and Aleppo in recent times. So 400 villages, some of them are small, some of them are medium-sized. That's a lot of territory, but that territory, of course, you can't liberate those towns by bombing you have to have a ground force that goes in and, and deals with the snipers and the IEDs and all of the other sorts of uh, problems there. So that's what the Syrian army has been doing with all its allies and losing people still with each town. In each town there are people wounded and killed. So the cost of that, I would say 99% of all of the sacrifice that's been made in those gains has been the Syrian army and its associated militia for all of the good things that the Russians have done. The Russians have lost three people in that time. They lost three people. Um, now with this partial withdrawal, um, Russians are still active there. Um, they haven't abandoned the operations there. They've also left behind the most advanced air defence system in the world, the S-400s, but I imagine still managed by Russians because typically countries don't give away their state-of-the-art technology to anyone, even their allies, basically, but they've got it there mainly to protect their own um, forces in Khmeim Air Base in Latakia, um, but the Russians are still active there. The diplomatic achievements is important to notice. Um, this is contrary to the way it's portrayed in the media. There was an interview by one of the ABC characters, um, Tony Jones, I think his name is. Um, who was he interviewing? Um, Bashar al-Jafari, the, the, the Syrian ambassador to the UN. And he was really, he of course was running the Washington line, which was, you know, Bashar al-Assad must go and, you know, there has to be a transitional government and so on. That's not in the UN Security Council resolution. The UN Security Council resolution of December last year um, says that the Syrian people will decide on an inclusive and non-sectarian governance of Syria. There is nothing about any individuals being or not being in government. That's precisely for the Syrian people to decide. And that means the Syrian people, if there's going to be a change in the constitution or the electoral law, 
there are elections, you know, due next month, regular, according to the Constitution, because the last Congress elections were in, uh, in early 2012. Um, also, the internationally designated terrorist groups, ISIS and al-Nusra in particular, but also associated entities with those two groups, which as Jay has pointed out, the, the two other biggest amalgamations of Syrian Salafists, Ar al-Sham and Jaysh al-Islam, have been associated with Jabhat al-Nusra since the beginning, since Jabhat al-Nusra went in from Tripoli across into Homs, basically. Uh, so that's why the Russians have been saying, these are the, we're bombing these groups, and the US was saying, but you're bombing our people, because um, they were associ in, associated entities with Jabhat al-Nusra. Um, so that was the contribution. Finally, now, this I want to just draw your attention to the regional scenario. What's been happening in this last five years? The, the plan was with Iraq back in 2006, 2007, you see a US map of what they'd hoped to do with Iraq left on the cover of the Atlantic, which is a liberal sort of uh, US magazine, was a balkanization of Iraq. That was the initial, there wasn't really a, a plan exactly for Syria, though they were still talking, they were even talking about greater Syria for some reason even though it was the, the contemporary Syria, not the greater Syria that Sam was talking about. But if you look at Iraq, they're talking about a Shiite Islamic state, a Sunni republic, and a Kurdistan up there. So the US had this idea of breaking up Iraq, um, which hasn't really happened, even though there is a, a type of operation going on with the, the, uh, the Iraqi Kurds, which is quite different to, to what the the Turkish Kurds are doing and quite different to what the Syrian Kurds are doing, but there's a type of a deal with the Iraqi Kurds that's going on there, but it's not a balkanization that way. That's the way it was being portrayed in the US in 2007. Two years ago, the same sort of thing was being mapped out by think tanks and other people for Syria. So the idea was here you're going to have maybe some sort of Druze protectorate which Israel would preside over in the south of, of Syria or alternatively, a caliphate which would stretch from Jordan to Dara. And there was earlier a plan for a caliphate from Tripoli to Homs, which would have been bigger than the whole territory of Lebanon. So all of these ideas have been around for a while, but there in the, the middle of, which is really mostly the desert of Syria, that's what, they, what they called in that map the Sunni-dominated central Syria. That was the, the caliphate that US intelligence was talking about in 2012 and an Alawi sector on the coast and so on, and the Kurdish sector in the, in the northeast. So all of these ideas for balkanization have been around for a decade, and they're still around, and they're not happening. Basically, the military tide has turned around. That simply isn't happening. Uh, to the contrary, what has happened is the axis of resistance has strengthened, and most significantly, Baghdad has been drawn into it. It's not a... Um, it, it's quite significant, I think, that... Baghdad and the Iraqi national government is the center of the intelligence operation against ISIS for all of those four plus two countries, for Russia, Syria, Iran, Iraq. So while Iraq is still linked into the US through arms contracts and a whole lot of different things which make it very difficult for an Iraqi prime minister to disentangle Iraq from the US grip more or less, they are at the same time actively engaged with their two neighbours, Syria and Iran, in this operation to clean their country of these terrorist groups which are destabilising it. So what's happened is this, the axis of resistance has strengthened significantly, they, including not least creating the strongest military uh, operation in the entire region. And that, that map, by the way, not, doesn't come from a map to do with the axis of resistance. It comes from the fears of Israel that that combined force is now going to be a conduit for arms to the Palestinian resistance in Palestine. So there's, there's the, the implicit threat that's seen in that, and that's why they didn't like the access to resistance to start with. And, of course, some people say, well, only Israel's one out of this conflict. They've sat back and watched Arabs kill each other or Muslims kill each other, and, and to a degree that's true. But they've also got their worst fears have come true now because that access has got very strong. Geopolitically, it means the US is going to lose control of the entire region, which is one of those things that empires tend to face. If you read, um, going back to some older history than what Sam was talking about, Alexander, Alexander the Great, the Macedonian king, went through the Middle East many millennia ago and conquered a whole lot of areas. 
uh, including Gaza. Some of them lasted two weeks. He conquered them. He was a psychopath, really, you know, murdered thousands and thousands of people. But they didn't last very long at all, some of them a, a very small amount of time. So that's, um, that's the, the, from balkanisation to integration, I call it, in brief. Um, some of that spell out in the book that uh, Gemma noticed there. That book is online if you want to have a read of it. Um, I'll, so that there's some time for questions, I'll end up now and the, the other speakers may might try to come down and, and Gemma's going to take some questions. Thank you. Thank you.